Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Royal Society. I must start with the usual plea to everyone to please turn off your mobile phones. Well, welcome to you all, and particularly to uh, uh, Sir Martin Evans and uh, Christine McGurty, who are going to be uh, participating in tonight's conversation event, which is, of course, a celebration of Sir Martin's Nobel Prize in particular and his general groundbreaking research in the life sciences. But there are other reasons for having this event today. It's a chance for the society to say thank you to many of our donors, benefactors and friends who are able to be here today. Just over a year ago, the society launched our 350th anniversary campaign. And I'm delighted to say that under the leadership of uh, Lord Sainsbury, we have now raised over £90 million thanks in no small part to people in this room. And you'll see on your desk a little newsletter, which, uh, on your chair, sorry, not your desks, uh, um, which uh, describes some of the initiatives funded by the campaign. And I'll just mention a few of them uh, this evening. Just this week, uh, we launched the Theo Murphy Blue Skies Research Awards. And the idea here is to have a sort of small... Uh, scheme for grants to support truly novel ideas that might have a hard time getting through conventional peer review and which may seed new areas of interdisciplinary research and perhaps help to forge something really new. These awards are funded by a bequest, in fact the largest bequest in the society's history, from the estate of Theo Murphy, who is an attorney from Melbourne. And you may, in fact, have heard on the Today programme this morning uh, some coverage of uh, these new awards and why they are, we hope, distinctive. Also this week, we've announced that the Royal Society's Enterprise Fund has closed its first round with over £5 million in gifts and pledges already and will begin making investments in very early-stage technology ventures. This is in effect, a small um, early-stage venture capital fund where the core capital is provided philanthropically by donors. And it really is a way in which the society can do its bit to help with the transfer of ideas uh, from the lab into the marketplace. Going right back to the foundation of the society in 1660, the founders were inspired by Francis Bacon, who, of course, said there were two reasons for doing science. One was enlightenment, and the other was what he called the relief of man's estate. And those two goals are as important now as they were then, and it's uh, a good uh, omen that the society can just this week uh, launch two initiatives at both ends of the spectrum, as it were. The Blue Skies research is to uh, uh, fund curiosity-driven ideas, um, and the uh, um, Enterprise Fund will help with the translation of uh, more mature research uh, into something uh, useful and productive. And neither of these initiatives would have been possible without philanthropy, which has been part of uh, the fundraising for this anniversary campaign. A couple of more things I'd like to say. Uh, we plan to open a new international centre out of London. And we can do this thanks to a generous pledge from the Cavley Foundation in California. And this will allow the society to purchase and renovate a very fine house in North Buckinghamshire called Chichley Hall and to run there a high-level programme of scientific meetings. And I think uh, uh, at the drinks after this event, there'll be a little movie which allows you to see something about uh, this place. And I want to mention one more thing which is more immediate, and that is that this lecture room, uh, as those who've been here before will realise, has been renovated the renovation's been done over the summer. It's not quite complete. We don't have the pictures back on the walls. But this has been made possible in large measure by a generous grant from the Wellcome Trust, which, of course, was responsible for building the uh, uh, lecture theatre originally. So we're very grateful to the Wellcome Trust for its generosity in allowing us to refurbish and update uh, this uh, uh, lecture theatre. Well, we've got much to celebrate as we prepare for our 350th anniversary in 2010, but we have a long way still to go. But I wanted really to say thank you most sincerely to all our friends and donors who have made possible what we've been able to do in the last few years to extend the Society's 
vision and its initiatives. Indeed, over 25% of the fellows have made personal contributions to the appeal, and that's very important in its own right, but also, of course, because it's the commitment of us as fellows uh, which uh, uh, makes uh, outsiders realise how much the society means to us and how important we think it is uh, to the nation and, indeed, more broadly. Well, having said all that and thanked uh, all of you for coming, let me now turn to the reason we're all here, which is to celebrate the life and work of uh, Martin Evans. After he graduated from Cambridge, Martin decided on a career studying the genetic control of vertebrate development, and through that he became a Fellow of the Royal Society and found a Fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences. He's received many awards, the Albert Lasker Award in 2001, and he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Medicine last year, along with Mario Capecci and Oliver Smithies, for a series of groundbreaking discoveries concerning embryonic stem cells and DNA recombination in mammals. And their discovery has led to a technology of gene targeting in mice and is now being applied in many areas of biomedicine, from basic research to the development of new therapies. Martin is currently director of the School of Biosciences and professor of mammalian genetics at Cardiff University. But chauvinism forces me to say that much of his best work was done in Cambridge, where he spent many productive years in the Gurdon Institute. Um, well, uh, Martin is going to be uh, interviewed by Christine McGurty, who's uh, well known uh, from the TV screen as a BBC science correspondent. And uh, uh, they'll have a conversation followed by questions from the floor. And so I'd like to thank Martin and Christine uh, for being here this evening and invite them to come up on the stage. Thank you very much. Well, welcome to you all. Journalists like me are a terribly nosy and curious bunch of people. In my jobs, I've worked at Nature and the Daily Telegraph and now in BBC TV and radio. And in each of those jobs, I've got a progressively shorter amount of time to interview people, uh, where the questions and answers in TV usually ask about, last about 15 seconds each. So this is a glorious privilege for me to be able to uh, sit down with Sir Martin and ask him some questions for a little while. And then there'll be plenty of opportunity for you two to, 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 uh, to, to ask your own questions. Um, as a journalist, of course, I know what everyone's interested in when they have a Nobel Prize winner at hand, which is, how did you hear about the, the prize? Tell us about that phone call. Well, it was a, a, quite a surprise phone call. I was uh, not back in Cardiff, but I was in Cambridge helping my daughter, who's here today, who was at the time very pregnant, and uh, they were trying desperately to get their house in some sort of order, and my wife and I had been up for a couple of weekends to try and help, and this particular time, which was a long weekend, we, uh, I had my oldest clothes on, I had a sander that I'd just hired in the back of the car, uh, Claire and Andrew had gone to work, and we were driving over to their house, and the phone went in my pocket in the back of the car, oh dear, and then I heard it ping again. I knew a message had come in. So I said to Judith, we'd better stop and see what that is. Pulled into the side of this fairly busy road uh, and um, listened to the message, which was from a secretary in Cardiff, saying, Martin, will you please, very urgently, phone this number as soon as possible? And do you have an inkling at this point? That, this um, that gave me a sort of slight inkling, but... Yes, maybe. You know, you don't know. It, it was a, obviously abroad, mm. and it was obviously urgent. I suddenly thought, well, maybe, but didn't know. It wasn't a very good place to stop, so I went a bit further on to a lay-by, phoned up, and it was Hans Jornval, who was the secretary of the committee, and he said to me, is that Professor Martin Evans? I have some very good news for you. And he then told me, and in the way that one does, it sort of slightly taken aback, I thought... I keep this conversation going. I want to find out more about this. So I started to ask him a few questions. And he said, no, no, I can't talk now. Um, the press conference where I've got to announce it is in five minutes' time, four minutes' time. And so <laughs> I heard just before the world. 
<laughs> and and uh, we went on and parked in an even slightly safer place in our shell-shocked state, in Budgeon's car park, uh, <laughs> where I then uh, phoned up my family, my children, and then uh, the vice-chancellor in Cardiff University. After which everything started descending on us. I, as I said, I had only very old clothes on. And we went to Claire's house, had a mobile phone, we had Claire's landline going incessantly. Fortunately, of course, Cardiff University's external relations team swung into action and all the press interest had descended on Cardiff. They didn't know where I was. <laughs> um, so they did a wonderful triage system. Uh, Fortunately, too, we'd been to the wedding of a friend of ours that weekend, and Judith rushed off in the car to fetch my suit, which we had there. Got it back just in time for me to finish doing up my trousers <laughs> when a taxi arrived to take me off to the television studios. And that's how it all happened. It was a complete whirlwind. And was there a sense of elation, or were you just worried about the sanding and you'd be in trouble with your daughter? Oh, no, no, I have no worry <laughs> on that, but... Um, it is, a, it, it is elation, but it's also, as I explained, it sort of takes you over very quickly. Um, you know, I was having telephone interviews, I was having television interviews. Um, requests were coming in thick and fast the whole time. And you don't really have time to sort of sit and think about it very much. So when did that it sinks happen? in slowly, I think. A few weeks, a few months? Hasn't done yet, really. <laughs> no, I think that's true. I mean, I, it is amazing. I mean, you know, I, from time to time I say, oh, gracious me, Martin, you're a Nobel Prize winner. <laughs> and it, 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 no, it's difficult to um, assimilate, I think. And uh, what about the money? And fast new sports car? Anything exciting? No, no, no. It's, <laughs> first of all, the money is not huge, of course, when it's divided by three. Um, and secondly, uh, I had a... a a mortgage out at the time. Uh, we were building a new house. And so what I used it to do was to pay off the mortgage immediately. Very sensible. And, uh, very sensible. So not very, not very um, exotic and dramatic. But it must but, have been a nice. few glasses of champagne. Oh, my around. goodness, lots of glasses of champagne. <laughs> yes, I mean, I don't count those. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go back to the, the beginnings of it all. Tell me, well, you know, what piqued your interest in science? Can you remember the, the early years of your childhood? I've been asked this before, and I think I've probably always been a scientist. Uh, very difficult to, to see what might trigger it, but when I think back to the earliest times when I can remember you know, myself and what I was doing, I was the same chap. I don't know if it's the same for the rest of you, but I haven't changed. I mean, it's the same little ego in there from when I was crawling around. And... I've been always very interested in science, what we would now say as science, very interested in the world around me, how things work. Um, yes, I think it's probably been going all the time. So there was never any question for you what you were going to study at university? Uh, no, by that time there's no question whatsoever. I, I, was, I was very keen, very keen on science in school. But you weren't the kind of very annoying and genius child who won all the prizes at every, every school year. No, I never won a prize at school. <laughs> um, in fact, this year I was invited because my old school said, oh, he's got a Nobel Prize, you know, he's worth knowing now. <laughs> they, they asked me to go and give the, the, the prizes at the prize giving. I hadn't been back there for 48 years. Uh, we should name and shame this school, shouldn't we? Who was the yeah, school a, who never gave it? It's a perfectly good school. <laughs> said, no, but I, I was, got a certain bad amount of uh, pleasure in saying to the assembled school of prize winners, uh, you know, I, I remember back, of course, I never won a prize when I was here. <laughs> <laughs> so... Univer your university years, how was that? I was very pleased to hear you say you find some of the maths and physical chemistry, some of that a bit tricky. Well, what I did um, at this school I just mentioned, we didn't have biology to ordinary level. And I wanted to do some biology. And so one of the ways to do that was to uh, stop doing maths after the um, advanced maths ordinary level which is what I did, uh, giving me 
a few terms before the sixth form to do some biology. Uh, and that's what I did. And so I therefore went into the sixth form and did botany, zoology, and chemistry. Chemistry was very much my love. I really, that was my aim. But of course, when I got through in Cambridge doing the part one chemistry, and I did all of it, uh, I was finding that the physical chemistry really was pretty tough uh, without the mathematics and without the physics. I mean, I, you know, I managed, but I could see that this was not going to be future, although organic was what I wanted to do. And um, I also started off doing botany and zoology. I didn't get on with zoology at Cambridge at the time. It was taught in a very systematic way, which is not the sort of way that I see the world, and I didn't find it an interesting way of seeing the world. So I gave it up after a term in order to double up on the botany, plant sciences, which was taught magnificently in those days, and in a completely different way, looking at the interaction of the, uh, the plants, the genetics, the environment, uh, the adaptation, um, the physiological adaptation of the plants. I mean, it was a much more intelligent course, in my opinion. I shouldn't be rude about other courses. <laughs> um, so I like that. But in order to do that, I had to change my subject choice and move my biochemistry into the first year as opposed to into the second year, which I did. And as I went through, it became clear that the chemistry which I wanted to do had to become biochemistry, which then went together with my interest in, in the, the biology. And of course, looking back now, your career and all those awards looks rather fabulous and glittering, but you had those the early years when the grants were rejected and yes. you were worrying about what you were going to do with yourself? I, I, I managed to keep grants going, but I have had a lot rejected. I'm often criticised that I'm too ambitious, that uh, I've got way out ideas. Um, and that doesn't go well with grant-giving bodies. You have to give them bread-and-butter stuff that will work, even if boring. Um, so what you have to learn to do is to give them bread and butter stuff, which will work if boring, uh, but then manage to get enough on the side to do the more interesting work. And then they're very pleased when you've done it. <laughs> now, in those crucial years where you were doing the research that ultimately led to, to the Nobel, I, was there ever, I know science isn't really like that, but did you have a eureka moment where you were working on those stem cells and thought, that's it, I've got it, this is going to work? Not really, because... The whole system came from basic studies on uh, developmental biology, cells of mouse teratocarcinomas. Uh, but uh, there had been a period, nearly five years, when it be had become obvious that it should have been possible to isolate these cells directly from an embryo, and that none of the cells which we had isolated through a tumour from an embryo were sufficiently normal to do everything we wanted. And we thought this was just because they'd gone through this tumour passage, they'd gone through passage in culture, they'd been selected to be abnormal. And if we could get them out straight away, they would have all the properties we wanted. So it was a process of refinement that got to the stage when I was able to do that. And when I saw those cells, I knew immediately what we had. It was just then a matter of proving it all. And how soon until you saw the, the practical applications? Because, of course, now the, tool, you know, the work that you've done has led to tools that are used all over the world. I think the, the practical application, that is the um, which is genetic manipulation, was always one of the aims and possibilities. And it had been uh, before we had the embryo, embryonal embryonic stem cells, we had the embryonal carcinoma cells. We had wanted to do genetics with them, uh, but we couldn't do it in the whole animal. Uh, it had clearly been a name. So once we had the embryonic stem cells, we could rush towards that process of getting them through into a breeding mouse. And then, because you can alter the genetics and select altered genetics in culture 
you could alter the genetics in the mouse. And I started off trying to do that by random mutation and selecting it, and starting to do it by making, uh, deliberately making random mutations by a process called insertional mutagenesis, where you use the biology of retroviruses, which uh, in, their, in their life cycle insert into the chromosomes, into the DNA. And of course, they can damage it as they do it. Uh, and if, instead of using live viruses, we use manipulated dead viruses, which basically just do a one-shot in there, then they have provided a single damage in the chromosome, a mutation. All we have to do is find out where and what it is and what it's doing. Tall, <laughs> tall order, but that's one of the things I was going for. And the, that I was actually working on uh, learning the methods for doing that when I met Oliver Smithers. Uh, I was in uh, Richard Mulligan's laboratory in the States for just a month. And I'd gone there to, to work, to work at the lab bench, not to see anybody, not to talk to anybody, not to go and give seminars or anything of that sort. And Oliver Smithers rang me up tracked me down. And I can remember to this day saying to him, Oliver, you're the only person I'll come and see. And I flew out to see him for the weekend. Uh, and that was because he had published about a month before, if I remember, uh, his paper showing that it was possible to deliberately change a gene in a cell in tissue culture, this homologous recombination gene targeting. And he proved that it was possible. And of course, I'd made, I and my colleagues had made, all of the cell and uh, developmental biology systems so we could grow the cells in culture, we could get them back into mice. I provided all of that. And what we needed was that precise gene alteration, which is what he had been developing. And then Mario Capecchi, who was the other person who'd been doing that in parallel by slightly different methods, um, <coughs> contacted contacted us and came to visit my lab within about a fortnight of my getting back. So the two of them were neck and neck on that. And how conscious were you then, or, or how much did you care about the likely practical applications of this work? Because they've been huge, but that wasn't necessarily what interests you. Well, it? I think the pra it depends what you call practical. I was very interested in an experimental mammalian genetics, in the ability to ask the question, what does this gene do? Can we alter this gene? Or can we find out which gene we've altered? And then see what it really does. Up until then, remember, most of genetics was, uh, oh, here's a funny creature. Uh, it's funny, we can show it it's funny because it's inherited it. it. It's a heritable change. But we don't know what's causing it. We know it's a mouse with a short tail, say, but we don't know why its tail's short, what's making its tail short. We don't know what functions are altered. Now, we can do it now entirely differently. We can say, oh, here's this really good bit of biochemistry. Uh, it's quite self-evident that it must be involved in such and such. Let's alter it, either take it out, take, remove the function, or indeed alter it quite subtly and see what happens. It's the other way around. It's asking the question from the other end. And of course, when we started, we were pretty naive on this. And uh, many of the people who were making these knockout mice were actually very disappointed with the results because they weren't what they expected. I had a I had a very clever PhD student, Darren Gilmore, one of the brightest students I've had. And he was doing a project in activating a protein that was made very early on in development. And it was called Spark, uh, which is a, a secreted protein, acid-rich cysteine, acid, acid protein rich in cysteine. And he 
was able to inactivate, it was able to breed his mice together, was able to show that they developed, apparently, perfectly normally. So I remember him giving a seminar saying that he had renamed it cystic, uh, cysteine rich acid protein, or CRAP. <laughs> <laughs> Because basically it was not doing what we expected it to do. But that's just our ignorance. In fact, I, I won't go into any more details, those mice show all sorts of subtle and interesting changes, which has led to many papers being published on them. But mm -hmm. Now, all your own work, you know, your curiosity shines out, and that's what drove you. But I know you're a bit concerned about the young the scientists of the future and the kind of yeah. education they're getting now? I am concerned. I think we sell science to the younger generation in a way that may be counterproductive. We tend to say, you know, learn all these facts, first of all. They shouldn't be facts. Then we say, if you work hard at your science, then you might get a good qualification and you can make money by being a doctor, or you can be, work in a pharmaceutical company, or you can become an engineer building bridges. I don't think we should say any of that. Those, these people we're talking to are impressionable idealists. They're at the stage of young teenage, so middle teenage, when they're looking at the world with new eyes, and they're just the people one or two of those I would like to encourage to continue to look at the world with new eyes. And I think we should be saying not just do this for a practical purpose. I think we should be saying some of the greatest achievement, I would say the greatest achievement of mankind, is our ability to understand <coughs> the world around us. And a great deal of that is based upon the science that we now know. If you don't understand the science, you have cut off a large proportion of your intellectual understanding of the world you've been born into. I think everybody should understand the basic science. They're not going to be top-level scientists. After all, if you do a fine arts degree, most of the people who do that are not going to end up being fine artists. They're going to end up doing very useful, respectful jobs and leaving, leading a very interesting life with a particular skill and knowledge of art, which is about the human condition. I think, just the same way, a liberal education should be absolutely heavy on understanding in science, not knowing every single formula and fact, but understanding it, understanding the world we live in, understanding the biosphere we live in, understanding that part of the biosphere which is ourselves and the interactions. And, you know, we don't sell that. We sell ourselves as technicians. I think we should sell ourselves as visionaries, which is what I think we are. So, Martin, thank you. It's really interesting. I could ask you so many more questions, but I feel I should let Sorry, the... Sorry, we've run out of time. <laughs> I feel I should <laughs> let the audience have a go. Um, we do have a couple of microphones, and we'll have a couple of people dashing around to bring them to you. So if anyone has a question, feel free to shove your arm up. There's a um, gentleman over there. Um, where, do you, um, where do you see stem cell biology and recombinant DNA technology in 50 or 100 years' time? What do you think we might be able to, to achieve with it? I'm not, not, uh, I'm not a person who would be able to predict 100 years' time, but I think uh, the recombination biology and stem cells are going to give us, using animal models, an absolutely complete understanding of genetic function. Now, where that takes us after that, I'm not... It, I don't see a prediction. Uh, the other side of that is the practical applications for medicine that are coming out of the studies with human ES cells 
And that's a very different situation. Uh, I suspect that that's going to be a whole new uh, paradigm of medicine. I think that uh, cell replacement technologies are going to become a very important arm of medicine. Uh, we've a long way to go. Huge hype goes on at the moment. Huge misinformation goes on at the moment. But the basic ideas are very sound and, I think, very practical. Yes, sir? I understand that stem cells are cells that can turn into anything. In fact, initially, you have just one cell, and that turns into a mouse or human being or whatever. Uh, is it possible at all to uh, explain how the cell knows whether to turn into a kidney or a big toe? Um, I mean, what, what, what is it in there that, that, that determines that, and can you influence it? The answer to that is that it's still being worked on, but we are getting... Uh, towards a better understanding of the sorts of combinations of uh, internal activity in the cell and the external environment. And remember, any individual cell is going to be growing in a body, so you're talking about not one cell, but you're talking about hundreds of thousands of cells cooperating. And we are beginning to understand some of the... Uh, genetic controls involved in this, yes we are. Um, I would like to go back a bit and say that, clarify your use of the word stem cell. If we talk about embryonic stem cells, these probably can develop, or their progeny can develop, into virtually any other cell type. Uh, there's a lot of use of the word stem cell because actually all it means is a cell which can provide uh, a replicative source of another cell type. And, for instance, we have the cells that provide the blood stem cell system, or the blood system. Those are stem cells, and uh, often, uh, misleadingly, they're entirely confused one with the other. Uh, I think what we're beginning to do, the, the words are possibly being used inadvisably, but we're beginning to understand the uh, controls both inside a cell and coming from outside that do a allow this specialization. Um, I think I should stop there. I could go on a long time, but maybe <laughs> it's... Uh, I mean, following on from there and going back, when you first isolated your embryonic stem cells, was there a problem in keeping them non-differentiated? Yes. And how did you do it? Um, the, the, yes, there is an absolutely a problem. These cells do differentiate, in other words, change into other types of cells, very rapidly and spontaneously. And the trick is to have culture conditions which allow them to or allow the majority of them to remain as stem cells. Uh, we're very fortunate in a way in the mouse, and I didn't explain any of the biology, but this all came from uh, clues from tumours, uh, that there are cells of this sort. I mean, it's not... It's quite self-evident, as, as from the previous question, that during the early stages of development, there must be cells whose progeny can give rise to virtually everything. But what is not self-evident, and is not true in some species, is that you can actually have those cells growing, marking time, staying in that state. Uh, in the case of the mouse, we knew that we could, and we had to use conditions uh, with what we now know are factors we used. I used uh, feeder cells, I used fibroblasts in the culture. Uh, we had to use very carefully chosen batches of serum uh, in our culture medium. And we had to use a very carefully prepared medium that was very pure, because one of the things that really kills these cells off badly are traces of detergent. And 
it's, you know, you wash your pipettes in detergent. And if you're not very careful, you make up media in bottles that have been washed in detergent and they'll never grow. So it was all of those sort of refining processes that got us there. So I'm head of um, Pfizer's Regenerative Medicine Unit. So is there a favourite therapy or a favourite treatment that you would want us to be working on? Oh. That's a very hard one. I think that probably one of the most promising things is the possibility of making sufficient heart muscle precursor cells to treat myocardial infarction. Now, we have some evidence from some small number of animal studies, as you will well know, I know, that it can be done. Uh, we also know that it is possible to get those sorts of cells in tissue culture. What hasn't really been done so far is to uh, find methods of getting large numbers of them reproducibly. And then, of course, the other side of it is, if we're going to use these for humans, uh, the other side of it is we've got to make them transplantable. We've got to make them so that, uh, for instance, if it's going to treat me, cells that I will not reject. Now, they could be cells of my own type, or they could be donor cells uh, which are sufficiently closely matched that I can cope or that my doctors can manage to stop them being rejected. Uh, so I think... That would be my preferred models to go for. And I'm certainly rather of the opinion that I would like to see uh, a personalised medicine where we can get the uh, possibility of reprogramming a patient's own cells to work sufficiently well, sufficiently rapidly and sufficiently safely that it could be applied on a personal basis. Now, that's a long... That's a big ask. It's not going to happen tomorrow, but I think it could happen. Yes, sir. Sorry, we'll take the question from the front and then go to the back. Uh, you outlined a vision at the end of how you wanted science teaching to be more based around the pupils asking questions and knowing the methods than the answers. Do you have any practical ideas for how that could be uh, put into practice? Well, I'm not, I'm not in that field myself, but I, one of the... Uh, types of initiative which I appreciated very much was the Nuffield Science Project, um, which, as you know, was taught uh, by a series of scenarios, experiments. And then it, the trouble with that is that you have to have a very good teacher. They, they are wonderful. It's a wonderful schema. But the teachers have to be up to it. And that's probably what we need. We need, perhaps we should be concentrating on teaching the teachers. I don't know. <laughs> so, Martin, you talked Hello, about Tim. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you talked very um, romantically about science and about understanding the universe and how what we can know is very little and we need to know more. Um, there's something very romantic about embryonic stem cells that perhaps catches all our imagination, which is the concept of renewal. Um, <clears throat> because some of those stem cells, if you will, as you <laughs> know, of course, entirely from your work, go germline. <laughs> and from generation to generation, we're regenerated with a, yes. a fresh lot. The grey hair goes, um, and we're young, um, young infants or, or young organisms um, with, uh, with a, another batch of gonadal cells um, to go on to the next generation. Do you think we know enough about the preservation of the nuclear genome and how it is regenerated out with telomerases and so on um, each time that we go through that natural cycle of, of forming gonads and in your um, experiments, of course, your germline, uh, going germline? Tim, there's a very simple answer to that question. No. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know nearly enough about it. No. Uh, but I think what we do have to bear in mind is, of course, we are looking at, in normal reproduction, we're looking at a biological system which has its failures. And 
we're looking at ourselves or other species as a species, as a population, and it's the population which is where selection occurs. And I think this is one of the, the, the problems, if you like, with our, our wish to provide a perfect medicine. Because, of course, uh, that's individualized. Whereas, perhaps the whole ethical thing is on the social scale. And really, I think, when we look at it scientifically, it's much more on a population scale. So, a simple answer to your question is, no, I don't think we know nearly enough. Um, there's some questions over here. Uh, one of the challenges in tissue regeneration is to go from looking at stem cells as monolayers or single cells into building three-dimensional structures. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you would like to comment, Sir Martin, on the difficulties you see in that, because, as you say, there's a lot of hype about ending up replacing the pancreas and all the organs as well as bone cartilage. And so that's the first one. What are the challenges? And secondly, do we actually have, in your view, the, the funding implicit in this country to enable us to take that next leap forward? Can I answer the second question first? I, I suspect that if well allocated, we probably do have the funding necessary for the uh, fundamental studies. What we don't have is, or what we may not have, is funding necessary for the uh, developmental phase of this, the, the, the spin-out into a practical application. Um, now, the, the question is said very rightly that, that it's all very easy to think of these in monolayers, uh, but of course we aren't monolayers, we are three-dimensional objects are. Um, our organs are largely made up three-dimensionally, although very often, of course, they are made up by folding of two dimensions. Um, my sort of slight answer to your question is that, uh, yes, there are methods of growing cells in suitable three-dimensional aggregates to allow specific differentiation to occur, and also that differentiation as we see it in the Petri dish is actually pretty well a multidimensional process. There are very few examples where you get nice, neat changing from one cell type into another cell type. Usually, you're uh, forming some sort of little aggregate patch, cooperative uh, lump of cells, which then you see differentiate out. So um, cells themselves know they've got to interact. One thing I would say, we haven't yet mentioned um, induced pluripotent cells, IPS cells. This is the amazing um, work that's been done in the last few years, mainly from uh, Japan. Uh, showing that you can take uh, an adult cell and manage to reprogram it back to an embryonic stem cell-like cell. Now that, these are called IPS cells. Now that is the biggest leap you can think of, really. Go from, say, a skin cell back to an early embryo cell. Now, if you could do that, you have to ask yourself, why can't you go from a skin cell, shall we say, to a heart muscle precursor? Why do you have to go back to this complicated embryological process? Why can't you flip them sideways? And I suspect that you will be able to. This is just a matter of understanding uh, the ways to perturb the rather well-established control processes in the cells. Uh, at the moment, uh, this is done by putting in uh, some transcription factors that change the transcription, and we know that the process is not a simple one. It's a, um, 
It's a process that takes place over some time. The transcription factors which are put in are the triggers, but then a lot of secondary events happen. Um, I suspect that if we start to understand this a little better, we're going to find that we're starting to have a cell phenotype engineering where we can take a cell of one type and deliberately with possibly transcription factors, possibly drugs, possibly inhibitors, possibly extracellular hormones, all of which we know are affecting it. If we got the right combinations, maybe we can flip it. So maybe that's in your 100 years' time. Hello, something a little different. Um, <laughs> I'm an organic chemist working in academe. I was very intrigued by your background, which closely mirrors my own, in the sense that I also did botany, zoology, chemistry at advanced level. Went to university, couldn't cope with physical chemistry, but unlike you, I stayed in organic chemistry. And I have a close association with the pharmaceutical industry. The first question you had... <coughs> Uh, which was raised was the future, 50 years. How do you see the evolution, the development, the consequences of stem cell research? What I'm interested in is how do you see the future of stem cell research against the possible demise of drug discovery, medicinal chemistry, the pharmaceutical industry? Well, I don't know if you mean the economic demise, but I don't see that the pharmaceutical industry is in uh, collapse as a useful, uh, as producing useful pharmaceutical products. What may be uh, failing, if you like, is the, the big pipeline to blockbusters. Uh, the trouble with these big blockbuster drugs is they may have funded pharmaceutical industry in recent years, but what they are, of course, is a one-size-fits-all type of drug. What we really need, I think, is far more of what's being termed personalised medicine, but uh, of a much more closely matched treatment. And the uh, pharmaceuticals, the small molecules and the, by and large, are, we now know, working by interfering with biological processes. By and large, they're uh, Drugs bind to biological molecules and change the action. Uh, now, as we understand more and more the control circuits that we're actually interested in, I think we'll be able to uh, still see uh, very beautiful, uh, beautifully designed pharmaceutical molecules able to have major effects. But um, perhaps the Perhaps the pipeline, the design philosophy, is not what we need now. Does that answer your question, do you think? I tend to agree with you. I, I was just reminded of a, a rather flippant comment that chemists used to make about biology, that, and, and it probably relates to medicine too, that biology is simply chemistry that hasn't yet been understood, and medicine is a primitive form of biology, but now <laughs> you're showing we are moving very rapidly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't, don't know how to answer that. <laughs> I, 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 I might just go back to my point that I think what our role, if you like, on Earth is to understand the planet sphere and the uh, universe in which we are. And part of that, a large part of that, is understanding the biology. And, you know, I don't think that uh, the chemistry, even the molecular biology, and certainly not the uh, atomic physics, is going to give us all the understanding of our biological complexity. It may underlie it all, but I think the processes we see are of a different order. Uh, given your <coughs> experience in the United States, I wonder if you would care to speculate on the impact up to now of the obstacles on research in this field 
and perhaps more daringly, to speculate on how far those obstacles are likely to disappear with what impact in Europe? I don't have experience in the States, first of all. Um, but the, the question is asking about the obstacles to work in the States. This is the objections to work on human embryonic stem cells, I'm sure. Uh, I think there's something which we all should remember. This is a presidential ban on NIH funding. It's not a legal restriction whatsoever on the work. And I think this should be contrasted with what we have in this country, very carefully crafted legal regulations so that work with embryos, human embryos, and with cells derived from human embryo embryos is legal under suitable license. And I think that's a very different situation. That applies to anybody in this country, be they uh, a small researcher in a lab, be they a private individual, or be they a large megalomaniac company. <laughs> now, in the United States, that last category is entirely unregulated. At the moment. <laughs> I'm aware we've only got short amount of time left, so do please stick your hands up or I shall jump in there myself with a few questions of my own. Are there any more questions from the floor? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I've got a little question about tools as somebody from completely outside of your field. We get told about the tools that you use, always by, an, by analogy, when thinks of tweezers and mechanistic, um, mechanistic tools. Presumably there's actually quite a lot of statistics, quite a lot of background, quite a lot of computer work and so forth. Could, could you just you know, give us a minute of, of background on the way things actually work? Oh, how difficult. Um, the way things act, well, most of the work I've done has been involved with tissue culture and with uh, looking at and manipulating early mouse embryos. So uh, the looking at and manipulating we need microscopes for. The tissue culture we need microscopes, incubators, and so on. Then further tools we need are uh, media, very carefully formulated media. We need serum, this sort of thing. And then, as you quite rightly mentioned, when we come on to the molecular biology and the analysis, we're using uh, tools of chemistry, we're using tools of biochemistry, and we're using, uh, for instance, as you quite rightly mentioned, statistics and computer analysis. Uh, difficult question to answer, I think. What tools don't we use? <laughs> Any other questions? Otherwise, lovely. Well, so Martin, that's been absolutely fascinating. You sound as passionate as ever about the research. Is there any chance at all you might put your feet up and get a bit of golf in, or no. what's on your horizon? Yeah, yeah, I must say yes. My wife's here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm, I haven't. My my feet have hardly touched the ground this year. Um, partly the Nobel partly because we've been building a new house. And one of the things one of our builders said to me, he said, Martin, it's OK. Somebody else will get the Nobel Prize next year. <laughs> so, <laughs> so maybe I'll have a little bit. <laughs> and I have to ask you, with a name like Evans and a, a job and a house in Cardiff, do you see yourself as a great Welsh Nobel Prize winner? <laughs> well, Wales does. Um, <laughs> I, just, just, just an anecdote, I think. I, I've... When I went there nine years ago, many people said to me, uh, oh, you're coming home, boy. <laughs> and I had to say, well, actually, no, I'm, my Welsh roots are fairly tenuous. But I understand that the thing to say here is that uh, Lloyd George knew my father. Is, is that right? <laughs> I said, I can't say that, but I can say that my father-in-law was sick in Lloyd George's car. Is that good enough? <laughs> <laughs> and this is wife Judith. Her, her, her grandfather 
was a Welsh artist, Christopher Williams, who knew Lloyd George very well, and Lloyd George, of course, as a famous politician, had the official car, and he uh, invited uh, Christopher Williams' two little boys of four and two for a ride in the car, you know, something they hadn't had before. And poor Gwyn, uh, Judith's father, as a four-year-old, um, got very excited. So <laughs> my father-in-law was sick in Lloyd George's car. <laughs> On that anecdote, I shall bring the, the hour to a close. Thank you so much, Sir Martin. It's been really interesting to hear from you. And uh, thanks, of course, um, thanks, of course, to the Royal Society for hosting this, uh, this event. Well, I, I would just like to uh, thank uh, uh, you both, and in particular to say what a pleasure and privilege it's been to hear Sir Martin. I think it's clear that he's someone who we are proud to have in our number. He's not only done great science... Uh, but he is, I think, an inspiration and a role model to the rest of us, and even more important to the younger generation. So thank you very much for uh, giving us the opportunity to uh, get your thoughts on so many matters this evening, Martin. Thank you very much indeed. I now invite everyone to adjourn to the rooms at the back for some refreshment. Thank you very much.